Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. And once again, it is time for the Monday Q&A. So let's get and get this started. Guys, this week I got very few questions. It's kind of weird because the Q&As have been getting a lot of views lately, but people just aren't asking that many questions. So I didn't have as many good ones to pick from. So sorry if people aren't happy about that, but people need to ask more questions if you want better questions. Uh, and remember guys, I post every Thursday, I start a thread on the Facebook fan page for you guys to ask the questions and because that's where I go to check it first thing when I go to do the Q and A's. I don't try to dig through all the comments and everywhere else looking for stuff. That's the spot where I go to. That's where everyone's been doing it for years. And that's where people know to go to post the questions and it makes it easier for me to just sort through all the questions right there. So that's where you do it guys on the Facebook fan page, Thursdays, Fridays, or Saturdays. All right. So what I'm going to do today, I went ahead and I picked seven fitness questions, three personal questions about me at the end, because some people are less interested in that stuff. And then I picked one off topic political type question, because again, I always leave stuff like that at the end now, because if people don't want to hear it, they've already got all the other informative stuff and they can just skip it. They don't got to put, they don't have to hear my opinions on something like that. And I'm totally cool with that. All right, let's get this started. First question. You said that it is possible to make good gains spending much less time than the average recreational lifter. Uh, then would it be possible to come three times per week and lift heavy only for one peak set with the rest pause method and still reach, say, 80% of your one-year uh, novice potential? That's harder to say, and the reason for that, I really like things like rest pause training, but what I find is that oftentimes the true novice, someone with less than maybe six months of serious training experience just don't have the neural efficiency and the skills to make maximum gains off of uh, like one extended set like that they're just not they don't have the neural efficiency and the motor patterns down on the big lifts well enough to utilize a method like that effectively to really make the best gains out of it so no at the very least i'm going to say no don't try to train like this at all as a novice come in and do a proper multi-set program at least your first six months. And if you wanted to switch to something like that six months in, that's fine. Even if you're still not fully through the true, what I call the true novice phase, you can switch six months in, but it's been six months learning the basics before you go to a more advanced system like that. These systems work. They work very effectively with very little gym time compared to a lot of other programs, but it's not what I'm going to recommend for someone with less than six months training. So trying to peek out your noob gains, the first part of your noob gains, no, Spend six months running something like my novice program or even uh, like my little linear hypertrophy program. Run something like that before you jump into a single set rest pause uh, type system. At least get your base started and learn the lifts correctly and build a strength base before you go to something like that. Or you're going to have a higher chance of injury and you're just going to get less out of it. All right, next question. Jason, I've been lifting for size and strength for about two years now and I want to compete in boxing soon. Uh, only been taking classes so far. I was wondering, would, would I have to give up lifting because it would increase my body weight to a weight class where people are a lot taller than me? Thanks. No, 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 no. You need to keep lifting, but what I would say if you're worried about gaining too much size and you need to focus purely upon explosive lifting. Remember what I did in last week's Q&A talking about wrestlers and some of those movements? We'll look at some of what I said there as far as exercises to help you build explosiveness and speed because lifting weights will make you faster. You need speed and power as a boxer. Weight lifting will give you more speed and power. It will do so more than pure boxing training. This is understood universally in the sports science world. Uh, many top martial artists, boxers, other people understand this it will make you far, far better. So you need to keep lifting, but don't go in and do a tons of bodybuilding work. Don't sit around doing three sets and five sets of 10 on everything. Uh, if you're worried about size, don't overeat. Eat enough food to train all your conditioning work, but don't overeat. I mean, you won't gain weight if you don't overeat. And number two, keep it, stick to purely explosive style training. Don't do any slow reps. Don't do anything to where you're thinking, hey, I, I want to do this to get some more size on. No, go in and think, what can I do to get more explosive and more powerful? And then you're still going to grow. Don't get me wrong. You can still put on a lot of size from explosive training. Arguably, depending on which expert you ask, just as much as hypertrophy training, if workload are sufficient. But that's another topic. You need to only focus upon the functional component of the hypertrophy. So if you're going to get bigger, just do it through shifts in body composition and training purely for explosiveness. That's what I'm going to recommend. And yeah, you may gain weight, you may not, but it's going to depend on how much you eat and how lean you're willing to get. 
but you should absolutely be lifting weights if you want to compete in boxing. I, I would not recommend that you stop lifting. All right, next question. Hey Jason, when doing rest pause training in the 70 to 80% range, that means 70 to 80% intensity or 70 to 80% of your one rep max, uh, should full body workouts three times a week be used or would that be too taxing to recover from? Would an upper lower two time a week frequency be wiser with this training style? You're not going to recover faster by training four days a week instead of three. I don't know why you would think that because oftentimes people will just throw in more workload. If you're worried about recovery due to the total taxation, cut your workload down. Don't do as many exercises. Now, I do the rest pause three times a week full body personally, but they, you may not be able to recover from that the same. The thing to remember with this rest pause training is that we actually find that recovery from it is pretty easy compared to the amount of growth that you get, meaning you can stimulate the amount of growth you seem to get from multi-set systems taken to failure, but it does seem to have uh, be easier to recover from in spite of the metabolic fatigue. So it's actually not that hard on recovery. Uh, depends on how far you extend out the rest pause set sometimes, but coming in and doing it full body three times a week is fine as long as you take a look at the total volume and number of exercises you're doing. If, for example, you're finding that doing deadlift and squat three times a week on a system like this, especially if you're doing all this other heavy work like rows and bench press and weighted chin-ups and stuff, you might need to alternate the squats and deadlifts around, for example. If you're, if you're not able to recover doing full rest pause of both every workout, you might need to cut one out each workout, alternate them, or change the ratios there. You don't necessarily need to go to an upper to lower because again, upper lower, you're going to end up doing more total workload, more days in the gym, less days resting. That's not going to help you if you're not recovering from the other one. So that's really not ideal. I mean, you could certainly do it that way. There's, if you wanted to do it that way, you could. But if you're doing that for recovery reasons, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. An extra day in, in the gym is not going to facilitate recovery any further. Another day of lifting. And I'm not saying the ladder won't work really well also because an upper lower four times a week, meaning each one two times a week is what I thought he was saying, that you're in the gym four days a week. On a rest pause could work just fine also. All right, next question. At what age should I expect starting a regress and lose gains? I'm 26 years old, 27 and three months, intermediate lifter, started lifting in early 20s, but now I'm hitting some serious stalls. Can I keep making gains or should I hop on that TRT? As far as the TRT thing goes, man, that's a personal choice. That's something you should discuss with the doctors, endocrinologists, something that you should research for yourself before deciding that. That's not something I'm going to answer based upon the limited amount of information you gave me here. But yeah, you're starting to stall now. If you've been training a few years, you're 26, about to turn 27, intermediate lifter, you're already going to stall as an intermediate no matter where you start. It's going to slow down. You're about to get to a point to where you're going to gain a pound or less of muscle every year. That's just reality. That's probably going to stop. If you're 26 now and intermediate, you're probably going to stop gaining muscle around 30 if you don't go on TRT or anything, or at least any noticeable amount. You're not going to be able to notice a difference in the amount you gain. It's going to be less than a pound a year, and you will start regressing probably somewhere between 30 and 35. You will probably start to regress and start losing muscle mass versus what you had before that if you stay completely natural. And that's just to do with your aging connective tissue. That's to do with your testosterone levels coming down a bit. And that's just the reality of it. We age, we get older. We don't keep what we had. And even for guys who are on gear, that's, that's true. You guys notice... I'm sure you guys have noticed, even me on TRT, that I am dramatically smaller and weaker than I was in my 20s. I don't walk around with 20-inch arms anymore. I don't bench 475. We get older, guys. That's the real world. So even TRT is not going to always keep you where you think you should be. It might help you make gains past a certain point, but if you were really big, younger, you're not going to keep even what you had on TRT. That's just the real world. We age. It's just part of the process. The best that you can do is offset the process to the best of your ability by training smarter, training better, eating better. But yeah, 30 to 35, somewhere in there, you're going to start regressing a little bit. All right, next question. Is overhead press any variation necessary for optimal shoulder hypertrophy? Let's throw this word optimal away. I hate the word optimal. Throw it away. It has no business in this industry. You will never figure out what optimal is. Now, Necessary is a pretty vague term. It's a pretty broad term. Is it necessary? No, it's absolutely not necessary. You can achieve maximum shoulder hypertrophy without doing an overhead press. 
is it a good idea to use it for this purpose? Yes, it is a very helpful, very useful tool. Now for overall function, if you want your shoulder to function correctly and athletically through all of its, its functions and what it's supposed to do from an athletic and fitness perspective, overhead press is necessary. Is it necessary to develop fully developed shoulders? No, absolutely not. It's not necessary for that, but it is very helpful and very useful. So I'm still going to recommend that you do an overhead press of some type if you want to fully develop your shoulders. So hopefully that clarifies that a bit. All right, next question. Is it best to get in most of your carbs before you train? If I'm going to say 400 grams of carbs and only get in 200 before training, would the other remaining 200 then be wasted and better off with the other two macros? Thanks. I don't understand what you mean about wasted. No, I'm going to say... Uh, from a training perspective, ideally, and again, nutrient timing is largely irrelevant for most lifters because you're not athletic enough, not active enough for this stuff to matter that much. It makes only a small difference, but if you really want to make the most difference with your meal timing, getting in the biggest chunk of your carbs shortly after training is probably going to be the best for overall glycogen replenishment. Uh, so that you can train again more effectively the next day because it's about glycogen replenishment, not always the fuel that you just recently ate when you walk into the gym. It's about how full your glycogen stores are, how full the fuel tank is, and your post-training is going to affect that very much, to a very large extent. Now, for people who are only training once a day, is this that big of a deal? No, we're talking about trying to gain a 1% to 3% advantage through your meal timing. It isn't critical or essential here, but if... We want to be exact and try to glean that little tiny advantage, which may or may not matter that much in the real world to your results if you're not competing in anything. Then making sure you get probably 200 grams out of your 400 right after you train or within the next couple of hours after you train would probably be uh, the best idea to maximize your results. And we'll skip the word optimal. All right, next question. Hello, Mr. Blaha. I power lift and have heard many things about core work. I personally believe that crunches and rotating movements uh, train bad motor patterns when it comes to power lifting. What are your thoughts on that? And what core work would you suggest for power lifting purposes? Currently, I do ab wheels, single arm farmers carry, and laying leg raises. All right, I'm familiar with this concept of the bad motor patterns from the crunches. I, I know some credible experts who believe it. I don't necessarily believe it, and I certainly know of a lot of very amazing power lifters who do core work. What I recommend is that you avoid any sort of rotational work. I do agree with that. You, I don't want to see people doing rotational work for their core just due to the potential for injury and no real benefit. And that's not going, it's not going to carry over to your power lifts. What I generally recommend is going to be if you have access to, to it, and it should be easy to set something like this up, any sort of standing crunch to where you stand and do crunches with either cables, preferably bands. I like to do mine with bands, hanging a band over like a cable crossover station at the gym and stand there and do standing crunches with it on your feet. And the reason is generally you need your core to be strongest when you're standing on your feet, driving through your heels on both the squat and the deadlift. So it's about specificity of training. Is it going to make that much difference in the real world? Probably not. It probably won't make that much difference what sort of core work you do as long as you're doing it. But Again, if we want to discuss specificity of training and trying to get something that's going to carry over the best, doing the standing work so that you can be driving through your heels as you do your core work is uh, a viable method. It's generally what I recommend to powerlifters. It's what I do myself. And I know a lot of guys like Louis Simmons are really big on this sort of thing. But any other core work that you want to do is, is a good thing. You can never really have too weak of a core, too strong of a core for powerlifting. Obviously, you have too weak of a core. You can't develop your core too much for powerlifting purposes. All right, next question, and we're getting to personal questions now. What is your favorite kind of music to listen to when you lift or before you go, uh, you lift to get you pumped? I don't try to get pumped on my way to the gym. I focus and relax. And if I want to get angry, traffic will take care of that for me. But at the gym, you know, I listen to a wide variety of music. It depends on what sort of mood I'm in. And people are going to be shocked at some of my choices, or maybe not. But I do listen to a lot of metal. I have everything from DSI to Judas Priest, uh, Slayer, Cradle of Filth, 
even some Dragon Force on my MP3 player, but I also listen to uh, a variety of dance music and hip-hop, pop, things like that. Like, for example, ones that may surprise people, I've got Rick Ross. I have Wiz Khalifa on my MP3 player for training. I have Madonna. I've got Lady Gaga and I've got Iggy Azalea. So... <laughs> Some of those might surprise you guys, but I work out to Madonna and Iggy Azalea sometimes too. Although I would say my mix is probably at least 50% metal. And I sometimes throw a little country in there too. I've been known to lift to Kenny Rogers. Depending upon how psyched up I want to get or if I just want to train in and just relax and focus. And sometimes even classical music. So I have pretty eclectic workout music taste with a leaning towards metal. All right, next question. Why don't you stop pussyfooting around with all this agnostic crap and say that you're a damn atheist? Uh, because I don't consider myself to be an atheist. I would say if you want to classify me with an exact term in the whole spectrum, I would probably be an agnostic theist or an agnostic deist. Because due to life experiences that I've had and seen and observed and felt, I think that there is a higher power. I think that there is a God. However, due to the unquantifiable nature of that belief that makes me agnostic but to say that i don't believe in a higher power uh, would simply not be true because i do i do believe there's a god i don't believe in christianity or any of that stuff i don't i don't think jesus was a real historical figure and i know that'll get me slammed so i don't buy into the whole christianity thing some of you guys know my mother was religiously jewish i don't really consider myself jewish either but i do believe in a god and it's something I can't quantify or explain. It's not something I try to convince other people of because that's of no interest to me. Uh, what I believe is purely a personal thing. And I happen to believe there's a higher power and a God. Uh, I do meditate. I do pray on occasion. But because it's something I can't prove, it's something I can't quantify or measure, that puts me in the realm of agnosticism. So hopefully that, that answers your question a lot better. All right, next question. <laughs> What are some of your favorite YouTube fitness channels to watch? I'm going to be honest, guys, and this is not too, I don't want to come across as being too arrogant here, but in my observation of just observing them over the years, uh, the other YouTube fitness channels have absolutely nothing to teach me. None of them really have knowledge on any of these topics that I don't have. So if I watch them, it's purely for entertainment value. And some of the their entertainment value is simply better on their other channels. Like I don't watch the Twin Muscle Workout but I love their relationship channel because they're fucking hilarious. So I watched uh, the Hodge Twins there, but I to say, have I watched a single one of their fitness videos in the last two years? I might have watched one. The only time I really watch other YouTube fitness is if they're talking about me or they're talking about a topic I just addressed and other people linked it to me because they either seem to be agreeing or disagreeing with me. To me, YouTube fitness is about me. It's not about the other channel. So if they're not discussing something relevant directly to me and my outreach, I don't watch them. And, and I, I like a lot of these guys. I chat with some of them. But to be fair, the overall YouTube fitness community, I find they're just not entertaining enough or intelligent enough for me to spend much time watching them. It's just not that interesting to me. I go to YouTube to watch firearm channels and I watch music videos. And I've honestly got to say that Iggy Azalea is probably more entertaining and more intelligent than most of YouTube fitness. And <laughs> she is. So, so you've got that component. So what else do I watch on there? Occasional documentaries, but I mostly watch firearm channels. I would say the two channels that I watch more than all of YouTube fitness combined outside of Vivo is Nut and Fancy and a Rock Veteran 8888. Those are probably the two channels that I watch more than all other YouTube combined. So I don't really watch YouTube fitness. Sorry, guys. I know that might shock a lot of you, but to me, YouTube fitness, my interaction with the other channels is about business. It has nothing to do with actually watching their channels. They're just not that entertaining to me or knowledgeable. All right. Next question. Last question of the week. This one is political in nature. So if you don't want those opinions, feel free to tune out. It won't hurt my feelings one bit. Uh, what do you think about the 800 shotguns found on the way into the EU? Well, guys, you guys know my stance on gun control. You know, I am actually, I think we have too much gun control in the United States already. Uh, I believe in arming people. I believe to be a true citizen of a republic, you must be armed. And that includes Europe. And I think the Paris shootings recently shows us 
that their gun control didn't work because people got access to all these full auto AK-47s in a country where they're illegal. They're also illegal in the United States, but people still got them here for some of these attacks like the Garland attack, but we killed them before they killed anybody else. So we didn't get on the news the same way like the Charlie Hebdo shooting did, even though it was kind of the same sort of scenario, two guys with AKs, but we fucked them up because this is Texas. So it didn't get the same headlines that the Charlie Hebdo situation had. But when I lived over in Europe, I'll tell you guys honestly, I saw a lot of full auto assault rifles in countries where they were completely illegal. I saw some AK-47s. I saw some H&K G3s. I uh, definitely saw a few different H&K battle rifles in civilian hands. The guns are already there. More of these weapons coming in to help the terrorists and the, the terror cells that are slipping in with the refugees, the terror cells that are already there is no surprise. It should come as no surprise to you. And uh, until people in Europe realize, and they are starting to realize that after the Paris saying the gun control policies they put in place have done, fuck all. They don't work. All they do is disarm the citizens and leave them helpless victims. Uh, your murder rates didn't even go down. Like in the UK, when they banned all these guns, the murder rate went up every year for the next seven years. The murder rate didn't actually go down. All they attribute to is less firearm death, but they didn't look at the total murder rate. If the murder rate goes up, this is counterproductive. It doesn't matter that they used, uh, didn't use the one tool that you're worried about if it went up across the board, and it did. And I think that's what we've seen in Europe in general. There have been higher murder rates as a result of disarming the citizens across the board. So... It hasn't worked, and now all these terrorists, uh, like we saw in the Paris incident, have free reign to just go ham on your asses because you have no way to defend yourselves from them. And these shotguns coming in is in the ones that got caught, which means there's probably a bunch that didn't get caught. Yeah, that's what's coming your way. And that's the price you're going to pay for being a disarmed country in a violent world. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.